Hello Tube. In today's video we're going to take a look again at the HP ThinClined T620. And uh, as I promised in the first video, I was very curious about running ESXi on this machine. So in this video we're going to take a look at it, demo it for a little bit. So here we're logged into the ThinClient and its ESXi web interface. As we can tell here we have a Eula Packard machine, this is the HP T620 quad-core thin client. We have four CPUs, as in four CPU cores, eight gigabytes of RAM, minus a little bit for the onboard graphics, and uh, yep, we have a working network card. Now this is a reasonably old version of ESXi, this is 6.5 update 2. The reason I installed this particular version is because I had an ISO image that had the Realtek network card drivers preloaded because this thing uses Realtek and Realtek is not natively supported under ESXi you have to inject third-party drivers in order to get it to work but uh, I had that I used that way back when I had the uh, Intel NUC that ran my web server and uh, some other things as well so uh, yeah I used that image works just fine I haven't bothered updating it just yet because everything seems to be working just fine so in terms of CPU capacity we have 1.5 GHz times 4 equals 6 GHz as we can tell. The RAM is well used, we have three virtual machines that we're going to take a look at today. And storage is just fine. I used uh, thin provisioning on all the machines except for this little MinOS virtual machine. We're going to take another crack at running Minecraft on the thin client. I was very dissatisfied with how it turned out thin uh, free NAS. So uh, we're going to have another crack at it. We have an Ubuntu 2004 machine, this is 20.04 to be more exact. And uh, this machine is running Docker in fact. So we'll take a look at that as well. And we have a Windows Server machine that is now currently set up as an IAS web server. The reason I chose these three small little deployments is because these are different use cases for a machine like this. They're all reasonably light, except for the Minecraft server, that's just an experiment. But you can definitely run a, a Docker host on hardware like this. It's more than powerful enough for most little things. Like your unified controller, and your pie hole, and uh, some other things. Some small dev stuff. So, uh, yeah, we're going to take a look at that in a bit. First, let's take a look at the Windows Virtual Machine. We are running Windows Server 2019. Here it is. We'll remote into it using MSTSC. Uh, that's not the IP I'm looking for. We're going to go to 202. There we are. Here we are at the desktop. We're going to do a terrible amount up here, but oh well. Just to show that everything is working, I assigned two processor cores and two gigabytes of RAM. And it seems to work just fine. I accidentally installed the Essentials version, but it shouldn't matter too much. It only limits you to the uh, types of roles you can use and some resource limits, but nothing too leery. Here we have the GX 415 GASOC. As you can tell, it's really not using all that much. It's just fine. RAM is quite low. It's not a production machine anyway, so it should be fine. So yeah, let's see how it does as a web server. We can browse to it. HTTPS is not enabled, so we can't do that, but we can go to the IP address. 168.1.202. Open it up. And here is the <laughs> generic template website that's running on the machine. And as you can see, we can scroll through this little template website just fine. It doesn't skip, it doesn't really seem to lag all that much. We can swap pages reasonably quickly. So I'd say as a little web server machine, this one, uh, this machine would do just fine. While consuming very little power, of course. So I guess that concludes the Windows machine. It's Again, this is just a little bit of a demo that we are going to have fun with. Here we have the Ubuntu 20.04 machine that is set up for use with Docker. Let's SSH into it using PuTTY. And a login. If I 
I want to remember my credentials. Yep, there we go. This machine only has one gigabyte of RAM and one CPU core assigned. If you bring up top, we can see what is using all of the various resources on the machine. RAM is reasonably in use, it's not using much swap, so it's okay for now. Unix operating systems typically like to use as much RAM as possible, so they can cache most of the things that uh, are needed re regularly, so higher memory usage is just fine. And it's not doing much. It's running absolutely perfectly. I choose to run Docker with a management tool called Portainer. I'm going to take a look at it now. Let's see, what was it? 203. Port 9000. There we go. And here we are logged on to Portainer. We can take a look at the containers we have right now. We have two of them. One is Portainer, <laughs> obviously. And we have a Pi-hole virtual machine. We're going to have some fun with that in a little bit. If you're not familiar with Portainer, it is a very handy Docker GUI that you can use for uh, the more basic ones if you don't want to make uh, Docker files with all your own custom instructions and just want some generic containers. Portainer is very easy to get started with. Basically, you go to containers, you can add a container here. You can use images if you have downloaded them. If not, you can just put in the name here. And uh, if you can't autofill it, you'll just have to type it out as you found it on a Docker Hub. It'll pull the image and make a container with that. You can set all of your various options down here. For instance, here you can make a couple of ports that you can use or that the uh, container needs to be accessed with. All that jazz, custom commands. You can assign volumes uh, down here. You can map them there. Network options some environmental stuff. Restart policy, very important if you want your Docker container to always start when your Docker host starts. And uh, yeah, with some very basic setup, I got this spy hole running. Basically, if you go to edit here, it needs a couple of ports to run. One of them is port 80 for the web management port, 443 for HTTPS mode. We need port 53 for DNS traffic. And that is basically it, because it is, of course, a DNS catch-all device that will uh, block ads on your network. So that is chugging away nicely. We can go to the management tool for the Pi hole while browsing again to the darker host at port 80. It will show us this. We have to go to the admin panel here. We can log into the admin panel. It's not showing a hell of a lot of queries because nothing is actually set up to use the Pi hole except the Pi hole itself. So let's change that. We'll have some fun again with the Windows Server machine. We'll set it up to use the Pi hole. There we go. Lock back in. Setting Windows up uh, to use custom DNS is quite easy. Just have to wait for it to load up. There we go. You have to go to the networking section, change the options for the network adapter, go to the properties of the network adapter in question, go to IP version 4, and change your DNS server to the DNS or to the IP address of the Pi hole. Now, the actual IP address of the Pi hole internally is in the 172 range because that's what Docker uses to net to IP addresses outside of the uh, container network. But we've forwarded port 80 and port 53 on this IP address, 203. This is the Docker host itself. So if we set 203, it will query ports or uh, IP address 203 at port 53 for DNS traffic. And they should find each other and start working and filtering our network. Now this is a website that always shows a big ad banner on top here. I'll show you that here. 
Ah, Pyle is actually working on my main network as well today. That is excellent. So let's demonstrate. We use a custom DNS for my main rig here. We'll bypass our own pie hole. Refresh the page. Clear cache. Let's clear the DNS cache. There we go. It would appear that it's actually broken. Excellent. So that's a bad demonstration. Huh. What do you know? Always when you start recording, right? So, if you go back to the pie hole that we set up on the dark host, let's focus on that for now. We have a couple of queries that were actually blocked, so that's nice. We have three clients, it says, so let's take another look at it. Let's see if we have some updates while we're at it. Yep, there we go, it's up to date. Here we can see what's been blocked. Scorecard Research, Google Analytics, Google Tag Services. And here we have the new client, 192.168.1.202. That's our Windows Server machine. It's made 19 requests already. So uh, Pyle is working on it and it's doing just fine. So we can go to some other websites. to msn.com scroll around a little bit alright I'll leave the machine for now now we have 161 queries and as you can see here we have a lot of ads blocked from the Microsoft network. MSN here, MSN here, Microsoft.com, some stuff from Taboola.com, whatever the hell that is. And we can now see we've made 40 DNS requests on the Windows Server machine. So that's pretty neat. So yeah, that's a perfect use case. Yeah, whatever. That's a perfect use case for um, a little machine like this. Containers like Pyhole sip very little resources. Just assign it some RAM and it should be just fine. You can run a web server on here, no problem. The biggest challenge that I've set up today is this Minecraft server. Let's go to the management tool for that. It's at a different IP address, it's at 204. It is an HTTPS port. I cannot type. And of course, I completely botched that. There we go. Let's log in. Server is running. No players online, obviously, because this one is not publicly available. Got some options set up so it reduces lag a little bit. I've stolen that from some website. Works fine for the Minecraft server that is actually in production on my network and used on a daily basis, so that's nice. You can see the log here. So let's go ahead and open Minecraft here using the Optifine mod because running single thread on Minecraft is absolutely painful. Alright, multiplayer. Wait for this one to ping for TC620. There it is, now we can connect to it. Let's look for some daylight in our little cabin here. It has confirmed that we're connected. Let's take a look at the resource usage. We're now using 2.1 gigahertz of CPU power. Just running one player on the actual server. 
2.4 gigahertz in total. And there we go. Here's a little area. Let's see if I remember how fishing works in this game. Fish. You got some cod. I used to play cod back in the day. Oh, that's no, called Call of Duty. I forgot about that. Got some skeletons over there. Hey, I don't have armor. Get out of my face. There we go. That works. My Duke Nukem skin over here. Very nice. Ah, right. That's new. Our Minecraft server is so old it doesn't have bees yet. That's one of those features that were added later. I guess they really chose the wrong day to be in my way. So yeah. <laughs> Seems to work okay. Ooh, this is very dark. Let's not go in there. I don't have any torches with me. But yeah, contrary to the Freenas video, it seems to work just fine <laughs> running on ESXi, oddly enough. So... That's pretty interesting, I'd say. I guess that really wraps the video up, just showcasing something you could do with a VMware ESXi on a thin client like this. Just some tasks that uh, would be very well suited to it. Running a web server, running Docker, even a light uh, Minecraft vanilla server if you have maybe one or two friends that connect to it, or just for your own house. Should be okay-ish. I would not really recommend it, something this slow, but you know, you can do it, I guess. But uh, definitely web servers, Docker, uh, home automation, light things like that. Absolutely fine on, on a machine like this. Sips very little power, so it's very efficient. You can put it somewhere else uh, where you don't even have to see it. It's fanless, it's passively cooled. All that really speaks in, the f in, in favor of this machine. So, you know, I guess uh, it's a pretty good uh, little thing. For stuff like that. I hope you enjoyed this video. I thank you all for watching and uh, stay tuned for some uh, more videos on the way very very soon.